Very nice. Thank you. You can actually bring in their code into one machine and run it and then demonstrate it if you have a limited number of microbits. Yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't, uh, fortunately, I have less than 30 students. I just bought three of, I just bought three of the, uh, the clubs out of my pocket. One of them was used, so <laughs> they all work though. So very good deal. I thought that would be a lot, a lot quicker than uh, writing a lot of curriculum. And I haven't, I haven't had to draw on them yet. So I hope they haven't lost them. <laughs> so. Only a, only a month and a half to go, so. Well, 201, I think we should get started. I'm gonna turn off my noisemakers. Welcome everybody to Wednesday's class. Somewhere I'm getting an echo. I'm sure Josh will squash the echo somehow, <laughs> or Matt will. Anyway, um, okay, so welcome back. Uh, Monday was a little bit rough. We, we learned a lot from our challenges on Monday and seem to have addressed them for the time being uh, between Andy and I, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, today is Wednesday. So some of the things we're going to go over, um, and this does not allocate the you know, proportionate amount of time to each item listed here as a bullet, but uh, tutorials and assessments. We're going to talk briefly about troubleshooting. Um, I have four support type items I'd like to go over uh, that I've accumulated since Monday. And then we're gonna spend some time together getting our robots to drive around. So hopefully you've got some centered servos and you may have had trouble centering servos uh, because we had some signaling issues on pins 18 and 19 that we're gonna talk about, but maybe you somehow got through that and swapped servos around and got them to center in your own way so you could build the robot. So assuming you got to that point, and then we're gonna find out when we talk about the solution to the problem, um, we will be doing some basic driving around with loops, functions, you know, parameters, and just talk about different ways to control the robot and what's happening behind the scenes. And then after that, we're gonna build a circuit together. We're gonna to build the whisker circuit. And I'd like to do this one together because I think it's a good example of a tutorial that features schematics, pictorials, and um, some subsystem building and coding to make sure things work. And then I'll give you some homework. Okay, so. Care. You can't imagine the reward. Visit you can go find that one. To find out more. This message is brought to you by Adopt US. Okay, I got it, Matt. <laughs> so anyway, um, first thing I'd like to show you, uh, I will use the document cam to demonstrate. Uh, we had a couple of, I think two boards on Monday, which pin 18 and 19 were not working right. And we are able to identify that one of them had an issue with the, sod, with the uh, servo headers not being soldered all the way in. So as you know now, um, these are the servo headers on the bottom. And so I drove yesterday to Parallax, 100 miles, and I encountered the, the problem and the solution. So the problem was that our selective solder machine that builds these, may or may not have been doing one of the steps totally correctly. And it has to do with a, what we call an upside down CNC soldering machine that you program in G code. And it has a little solder bubble and I'm gonna take you to that bubble right now. And this bubble has a varying height of solder that comes out. So here's an example of that. See that bubble? That's soldering the bottom of a board. And we try to get it within a you know, millimeter or two, but we don't have perfect control because it's kind of a wide bubble of fluid there. So anyway, um, the manufacturing guys, in particular Terrell, are alerted me that in the past we have had a few issues with these servo headers and that we may not have caught them because they're part of the visual inspection. 
So if you have a board that has that problem, let me know. I don't think we'll have any more troubled boards going out of the office, but um, it can happen. So I think I replaced the, the one or two that we identified. The next thing I'd like to talk about um, in the support world, again, item number two, switch back to the um, document camera, which has just disappeared. And maybe someone can just verify that they do see a document camera. The thumbs up or something. Verified. Thank you, Andy Amo. Oh, by the way, I'd like to uh, thank Andy for joining us today. Um, Andy is the Andy Lindsay of Parallax. He's written all of our books and he's contributed so much to this. And we also have Matt here from Cyber who's doing some amazing work behind the scenes. Maybe they'll talk a little bit about it on Friday. And I'm not sure that Josh, oh, and Josh Coriel is also here from Cyber. So. We got a whole team and we're more organized with the breakout rooms if we want to use them. Okay, so this particular issue, um, we had one red flashing light on Monday, and I want to show you a false positive that I've observed that I've seen other customers fall into as a trap as well. So the situation is that the robot is on, and in this case, my power jack is not plugged all the way in. And I see that red light, but that power jack sure feels like it's plugged in. All right, but it is not. And so what's happening is the power supply is low, below five volts. There's not enough current or voltage to do anything. And it's not even wired to do anything. But the battery pack is actually good. I have seven and a half volts. So when you plug that in all the way, and then you cycle power, that is gone. So we had one teacher using rechargeable um, NICADs and I'm not sure if the problem was the battery jack being a little bit loose, causing that low power indicator to go on, or if his power supply was actually low. That's item number two. Item number three that I'd like to show is the following. I have to get the somehow the zoom control out of the way of the slideshow. All right, there we go. Waiting for things to load. Slide number 65 illustrates something I was talking about on Monday, but probably didn't make totally clear. And it's the two different ways to mount your motors. And I was uh, mentioning that I like to have them center mounted like you've shown here. So it gets a tighter turn radius and doesn't have as much friction on the back wheel. And then the other way is you could turn the um, servos around and then the wheels are forward. So preference is to use center mounted and you'll get uh, good turning on all floors, even sticky floors like you have in the South if you have linoleum or something like that. And then item number four is the following. And I'll demonstrate this uh, with this code. And I have Andy here also to help out on this particular subject. So I'll tell you what I know about it briefly, then um, he can fill us in. So we're using the Microbit V20, which is new. And as I mentioned in the email, we've tested the beta units of these. And I don't think we've actually had a really good opportunity to test them in, in mass use like we get with all of you teachers present. So we encountered this issue on Monday where we had. Um, code like this and we were centering servos and we we're all running it and we had various issues out there. Some of us were seeing signals on the first line of code, but not the second. And what was going on behind the scenes, because I brought in the professional, always surround yourself with people that know much more than you do. <laughs> That's why Andy's with us. Um, brought in Andy to look into this problem and there was a micro bit boot up process that we need to account for as it communicates with the coprocessor or the propeller one that's on the board, which we've not discussed too much, why that's there and what it does. But basically we needed some time, we needed to give it some time to make sure that the, the I2C commands are, are working right. And this Sleep 500 does that 
for us. So rather than put a, put a sleep 500 in front of all of our code, um, we distributed via, via email a new cyberbot.py that has it. So you can use that new cyberbot.py and I'm gonna drop a link into the chat right now to everybody. In case you did not get it from my email, here it is on Google Drive, All right? And so that cyberbot.py eliminates the need for that sleep 500. And when you go into your micro bit and you have your, your old one, you need to delete it by pressing delete and then you could add your new one. All right. Andy, you want to comment on it? Unmute yourself. The quiet Andy's very quiet. Uh, sorry about that. No, we got on the wrong screen. Um, yeah. Uh, so what was happening um, is that something in the microbit version two, uh, when when it wakes, uh, so so when you um, turn on the power to uh, the cyberbot, what happens is both the microbit and the propeller microcontroller that is on the um, cyberbot board, those two microcontrollers start um, communicating with each other. And uh, they have some back and forth just to make sure that they are communicating. Um, yeah, uh, actually, if you go back, Ken, um, the, uh, I saw it just stop back down. Right at, okay, now in the middle, there we go. <laughs> so uh, do you see where it says I2C bus? Okay, that, that is the micro bit and the propeller communicating. And the micro bit sends uh, information over that I2C bus, which is a couple of wires and a couple of resistors, um, but a kind of complicated protocol of, of uh, sending binary values back and forth to um, potentially more than just one uh, client on the bus. But the, the, uh, the, the micro bit sends messages that's essentially uh, over this bus that say, hey, propeller, um, start sending signals to the servo connected to P18. Okay, great. We're done with that. Now, hey, propeller, start sending servo signals that, that last this long to P19. So that's uh, that's upstairs in the 1819 that go to the wheels on the cyberbot in the upper right. And um, so uh, everything was working fine when we tested it. And then lo and behold, this new thing came up. And what it turns out is that after the propeller and the microbit have their initial conversation on the I squared C bus, they basically shake hands and say, okay, now we're communicating. Um, the first thing that the microbit tells the propeller to do is getting lost in is getting lost somewhere. Now, I don't know exactly where yet uh, because my focus was um, making sure that you had a viable um, solution to keep going. So what we have right now is this patch where uh, the new microbit module that Ken gave you the link to uh, has a built-in sleep 500. So it basically waits a half a second. And because of that, uh, the message does not get missed. Um, now, exactly why this is happening on the V2, but not on the V1, I'm, I'm not sure yet, uh, but I'll be spending some time on that. And typically what happens is I either um, update the Cyberbot module or um, I go to the code repository for the micro bit and explain the symptoms that I'm seeing because uh, their goal is to make the micro bit V2 match the V1 uh, in in all ways of behavior. And so this is a difference from the version 1.5 uh, or version 1.38 micro bits. And so they'll wanna know about it, but um, finding the exact difference and boiling it down is gonna take a while. So instead we just made sure to give you something so that you could keep moving forward for now. And then there's a uh, more to the root of the problem solution on its way. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, particularly tricky when you combine this behavior with the soldering issue that we found on Monday. So we were scratching our heads until late on Monday, but by Tuesday at noon, we were further down the road to solve this. But uh, Andy, 
follow us up on the GitHub with Microbit Foundation. And this is quite common when you have, you know, browsers that are changing, you have firmware from Microbit and you have software made by somebody else. We just got to keep all this stuff in sync. So that's our objective. And um, anyway, yeah, hopefully, hopefully wasn't too much of an inconvenience. So we'll let you know when we have our permanent fix out. But if you go download the latest cyberbot.py after today, things should always be good. And we'll update that too. And if, if for any reason, or if you notice any other issues, uh, please give us a shout out because um, because we need to know uh, as quickly as possible so we can fix that it for everyone. Thanks, Andy. Thank okay. you, Ken. Moving on, um, Lynn Dalfer sent in this picture. I just wanted to share it. And um, his he was making several points, um, but one of them is the, the compatibility between the Cyberbot and the Shield bot. It's just a matter of changing the board on top because the motors, battery pack, everything underneath is the same. And we intentionally keep this the same and have for many years so we don't obsolete teacher hardware and so that all the accessories work across all the robots. Anything else you want to say about that, Lynn? OK. If you, if you want, you could jump back in time. OK, next, um, before we move into making our bots go, which I, I really want to do, um, just briefly talk about the login for learn.parallax.com. So yesterday, I believe Christina would have sent you a login for learn.parallax.com. And once you have that login, you can go into educators and then cyberbot resources. And here's everything uh, for the teacher only side. Um, on the very bottom, there's a link to the assessment material, which really correlate nicely to all of the exercises. There's a standards matrix, there's the link to the slides, teaching guides, there's scope and sequence, so you know how to deploy this in a, in a classroom with the time you've got. Thanks, Matt. Um, so give this a look and just briefly, we'll get a super fast look at the assessment material. We got a lot of effort to um, build these. So let us know if they're working for you. I'm going to download one of them. And the Zoom controls are a little bit in the way, so I'll just get out of the view I was in. So these are available in PDF and in RTF format, so you can bring them into Word and change them. Um, they're, they're not in Canvas. We'd like to get them into Canvas. Now my screen reader program is taking over my computer. Sorry about that. Okay. So this is what they look like, and then the answers are at the back. So we can give you a little bit of an edge on your on your students that way. Any questions about that kind of content from Parallax? If we didn't receive a login. Yeah, just uh, send me an email, Stephanie, and I'll, I'll get it for you. OK, thank you. That's important to have. I want, want to make sure you're all um, up to speed on, you know, not only the technical issues, but the resource issues. Okay, so let's talk about um, this for a moment. And then we're going to actually be writing a, a Python script together. And so you can get your robots ready. And by the way, I moved a little bit fast, but did everybody get their servos centered okay, even though we had this issue with the cyberbot.py? Maybe some thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, I see two out of uh, 50 did. <laughs> 48 more of you. And if you have trouble, okay, or had trouble or have any trouble at all after today's meeting when we end it within one hour, I'll stay here as long as needed to help people out. So it looks like most of us um, succeeded. And if you haven't or are afraid to say so, um, I'll definitely help you out afterwards. So don't worry about it. We can even come into your classroom and help out that way if needed. So servo control. Um, one thing I like about the Cyberbot and the firmware that we have written that goes into the, uh, the library and the propeller is that the servo signals are maintained for you. And actually the, the micro bit can do this on its own, but the processor that's accompanying it does it much better. 
So when you give a, a speed command to your robot, well, if it's zero, or let's start with minus 100 to zero to positive 100, what's really happening behind the scenes is there's a series of pulses that are delivered. And those pulses are a logic high and they vary between one millisecond and two milliseconds. So one millisecond is full speed direction, full speed counter, two milliseconds is full speed clockwise or the reverse, I forget which is which. And then 1.5 is the same. So normally programming a microcontroller, you have to, con you have to do this stuff on your own um, and maintain that pulse all the time. But once we give it a speed, these are set it and forget it speeds. So it's very handy, but the student may not know this. So it's abstracted a, a little bit for them in this way. And it makes it easier to code. And you'll notice too that to go forward, you will give the left servo a negative speed and the right one a positive speed. And that's because if you turn the robot over, the one servo is flipped over. So to go forward, one has to rotate clockwise and the other one has to rotate counterclockwise. Okay, so briefly, um, how do the motor command set directions and speed? So I mentioned you can go from minus 100 to positive 100 for the arguments on the speed. Oh my God. Some are set up, Mike, you can take it. <laughs> All right, so you can go from minus 100 to positive 100 and then zero is standing still. However, you can also put the argument in there of none, which we will, we will see that momentarily. So if your servers are not perfectly centered, you, you might wanna just use none there. And you can turn a whole bunch of ways, like here is a, a zero turn radius, like your Midwest lawnmowers. We don't get to have grass like that in California because we don't have the space or even the water to grow it. So we don't even know what a ZTR lawnmower is, but that's when your wheels are going in opposite directions and you turn in place. So you would send the same value to each motor. So two positive values would cause you to turn one way and then two negative would go the other way. So that's a great way to turn when you encounter an object in front of you. Um, in this slide, what I'd like to draw your attention to is two things. On the source code you see on the left, on the script on the left, you'll see the argument we're using is none. So we go forward and then we, we pause for three seconds and that means there's just not another command for three seconds. Now in, in real robo land, you aren't going to be roaming open loop like this. You'd be checking sensors. So that 3,000, three seconds is really a time you'd be running into a wall, but we don't really see this once we start to use sensors. But suppose you have like a dead reckoning maze or something on the floor that you want students to demonstrate. Um, how far to travel, which is a function of speed and time, this is what you do. So instead of putting zero, zero, you can say none, and that's no values provided to the motor, and it will just stop. And you should also be using this bot detach at the end of code that does not use a loop. So this is non-looping code on the left, and on the right side, you see a loop. And this particular loop um, goes forward and backward, just back and forth forever. So there's no need to use bot detach, which disconnects us from the, what Andy was speaking about, the I2C bus and the, the propeller chip. Okay, so what I thought we'd do um, is spend about six minutes, seven minutes, just writing some code together because the most important thing is to find examples, to type your own code, and to get a feel for this. I always find that when I'm new to a, an environment or a coding system of any kind, it's such a struggle just to start typing. But once you do that, then things get easier. Then you can find examples and you're on your way. So I will just copy and paste this into an editor, into a Python editor. And then we can evolve it together for the moment. I do have a quick question before we get going with that. Do we have to put in the module each time we go to do this? 
Andy or Matt, you guys can take that one while I get ready. Sure. Um, although it, it would help to, um, after you're ready, do a, a quick example of this. Uh, the answer to it is is um, the, the load save button that you see on Ken's screen right now. You're going to click that and then add the module. Um, the load save button also has an option to save uh, the hex file. It, it allows you to save a, a .py file, the script, or a .hex file, which is a package that contains both the script and any modules you added. So you had to add the module. So if you save the module, or if, if you save this as a .hex file using that load save button, <clears throat> then when you open it back up, uh, it will, it because the hex file stores your cyberbot.py uh, module, um, it'll still be there. And in fact, what I do is I uh, make liberal use of save as by just changing the script name that's in the upper right of, uh, of Ken's um, browser right now. It says microbit script probably. And uh, each time you change that name, then you go back to the load save button. And when you save it as a hex file, uh, the uh, the cyberbot module keeps on coming with you and keeps on getting stored in that file. It's like having a project versus having just the script and having to add the other pieces. So um, so the answer is if you start with say copying and pasting from a web page, uh, as long as you open a script where you previously added um, the uh, the cyberbot module, then you'll be fine. Uh, oh, did Ken just uh, show us? Can you do that one more time, Ken? The, yeah, sure. the load save. Oh, whoops. Um, load save. It's right here. And then download room. project hex. So uh, because it says show files to in the project files drop dropdown, uh, that means he's got, yeah. So, so now microbit program, when he saves that, um, that will continue to contain the, um, the uh, cyberbot module. And uh, to open that, all you have to do is hit load, save again, and it lets you browse for and find and open that. Right here. So that cyberbot.py travels with the hex file. If you just save the Python script, all it's saving is a text file of what you're looking at on your screen. So if we all got that, that's important. That took a long time for me to, uh, to register with me. So I pasted some code. Um, into the chat if you want to copy and paste it. And then we'll just modify this a little bit before we go to the whisker circuit. And I've got my camera up so you can see what the robot does. And um, you, if you paste in the code, you might need to add back your cyberbot.py. I'm just going to make sure that mine is here, and it is. So I can now just flash this. And my robot is on position two. And it should take off for three seconds. And of course, I've got my cable connected. And when you teach classes of teachers, it's really common that most of the class is done with a cable on it, but disconnect that cable, OK? And um, go roll. All points, all points bulletin. Um, <laughs> if, 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 you're, um, if your cyberbot is pivoting around on one wheel instead of rolling forward like Ken's did, it means that you are still working with the older cyberbot module. You can fix that by adding sleep 500 um, essentially on line three, looking at Ken's screen. Just like I'm doing. So yeah, just to make that clear, if you didn't <laughs> use the new cyberbot.py. OK. All right, so the robot took off for three seconds. That's good. And we want to make it come back. And then we'll put it into a loop and do a little bit more. So. Um, to make it come back, I just copy and paste that code and let's change around a few things. And what I'm going to do is change the comment to backward. And I'm going to change the arguments here to minus 75 and plus 75. And connect and we'll download and now we'll see it come back.
All good. I, I assume you guys are playing along right now. I can't tell. So I'll give you a minute to try that. In these classes, we absolutely push the use of Zoom and the participants about as far as we can. Technically, I realize you're using, you know, using Zoom, trying to watch what I've got and trying to use your own Python editor at the same time. Okay, I'm not getting any movement from my motors. Switch in position two? Yes. Okay. Um, are the, uh, let's see here. The, the white servo wires should be closer to the edge of the board. The black, yes. okay. Um, and then they're in, uh, are they plugged down firmly over the pins on P18 uh, and P19? Yes. All right. Um, when you hit uh, flash, so, so um, see that flash button in the upper left of, of Ken's um, monitor, hit that on mm -hmm. your screen and then click open serial. And let's see if you've got any uh, messages from the micro bit saying, uh, talking about um, problems. Codes. Okay, yeah, so you said might, the flash. Andrew, you might use a breakout room. Yep, I'm ready. Let's see, let's see though, finish up in case others have the same issue. Oh, okay, yeah, let's open serial and find out if there's any messages about um, maybe a missing module, for example. I, I'm having the same issue, but when I didn't do, before I um, copied and pasted the code and to do the um, backwards, to have it reverse, it moved forward and stopped just fine. But then when I added, you know, to have it go the other direction and switched the 75, negative 75 and 75, now it's not doing anything. So I'm having the same issue. You might want to, could you paste your code in the chat just so we could see that? That might be helpful. Anyone else? Just give us a general feeling on the, the nature of the problems right now. Okay, here we go. Uh, no module named Cyberbot. So that's going to be, uh, Ken, can you just kind sure. of give them one more recap on adding the Cyberbot yeah. module? Okay, so um, if, if you have a, a problem, let's just say that we have a syntax error and I'll just create one right now for us. All right, so I changed the name of the Cyberbot module, but what you have is it's not, not actually there. All right, so that didn't do what I wanted to do, but let's just look at how to add it again. So you're missing it. Um, if you go into load save and then show files, at the bottom, you'll see that cyberbot.py is probably not there. So for example, if I just delete it right now on mine, and then I go to flash and it is included, we'll see what happens. Okay, okay, so hit open serial, it does nothing. Yeah, you get the error message on the LED display. And then in open serial, it'll tell you that there isn't a Cyberbot module. And it's and that's our clue that we want to add one. So you have two ways of getting the error. One is through opening serial. The other one is looking at the micro bit. And it will scroll you some text, which can be painful to read. So go back in to um, add it again. Uh, show files can cancel out. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Add file. Oh, that way. Okay. All right. So you could do it two ways. Browse for file like I showed yesterday or show files add. And I'm adding the one that I distributed by email or that was in the, the link um, to the drive folder just a little while ago. And then you can close serial and hopefully that fixed your problem. Other issues? How about the robot that was going forward but not returning? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a forward and it pauses for three seconds. And then there's uh, the none. And then after it is the backward. And I think that what we need to do is move that backward routine um, between uh, above the stop comment 
And if you do that, then it will, um, then it'll start to run properly. So if, if you look at Ken's screen, you'll see that he has forward, backward, stop. And then um, the one code example I'm seeing from Dana has forward, stop, backward. And I think if we take all that backward code and put it above stop and then try rerunning it, it should work. What's the name of that file that you had to put in? Cyberbot.py. Okay, that's in. Matt, if you could put another link to that in the chat from the- I've got it on there, but I'm still getting a line six. There's no such thing as bot. I think maybe you don't have it there then, but you should have an error above that actually. Well, I'm, I'm reading it off of the alphanumeric screen on the cyber- On the, cyber on the micro bit? Micro bit, yeah. Okay, you probably have a, you might have a syntax there. Okay. So check that. Um, for example, if I say, uh, if I just change this line seven and I misspell the word servo, and then I go to mm -hmm. flash again, if I'm on the same line as you, yep. I should see something like this. Okay. I see an unhappy face. If you're standing on your head, that is an unhappy face and it says line seven. Yeah. Did you see that on yours, Mark? Line. Nine, three seconds. I know that much. Woman. Eight. No. Eight. Name. Error. How do you stop it? N O N A M E. Okay. Well, you work on that. I'm going to go ahead and move on a little bit with this code so we can get to the whiskers. Okay. Bot is not. If you'd like, I can go ahead and uh, open up breakout a breakout room. room. Yeah. Uh, I'll open up a breakout room, and anybody who is still having trouble with that, you'll be able to uh, move over to it, and we can have someone go in there and help out with it. I'm available, um, unless, Josh, you want to do it. Andy, maybe you should take them. Yeah. I'll take them. Yep. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and create it. Just uh, click breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen and choose to go into it if you need further assistance. Okay. For those that um, are ready to move on, we're going to modify our code. I'd like to make a square and I'd like to use a loop to do it because a square is nothing more than I got a message really quick, Matt. Should I broadcast to all then? about the breakout room. I'll do that. Okay. All right, so we'd like to drive in a square. And a square is nothing more than, as you can see when this finally loads, a little bit sluggish on the Google slide. Our slideshow's gotten, needs to go on a diet, I think. So a square is go straight, turn right, go straight, turn right. Um, four times. So let's modify our code to do that. And we'll create a repeat loop to do it. And so I'll, I'll try to identify the, the lines of code that I change in doing this. Just going to create a variable. Y, and I'm in a loop from zero to four, and that's actually counting from zero to three, which is four, because in Python that four is exclusive. Now, the editor needs to know what's inside of that loop. So I'm going to indent everything that goes inside of it underneath. Okay, so if I run this right now, the robot's just going to go straight forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. It's not going to give me the square. So let's make another change here. And now I'm commenting the lines that I'm changing. Actually, I'll say, uh, yeah, changed, changed or added is really what I mean here. And instead of uh, traveling for three seconds, since your, your desk may not be that large, 
let's just use like um, one second. So I changed the 3000 to 1000 on the straight command, forward command. And then how do I turn right? So the left motor, a couple of ways to turn right. Um, I could just stop the left motor or the right motor, which is on 19. So I'll just give it a zero for starters. And then on the left one, I will provide a value. I don't know if it should be negative. Uh, it looks like it should be a positive value. So I'll provide a positive value of 75. It could be 100. It could be anything pretty much above 10. And if I turn for three seconds, I'm really going to be spinning around for quite some time. So how about if I just try like, I don't really know what the magic number is. OK, but I'll try. 600 milliseconds, a little over half of a second. And if you'd like, I can paste this code into the chat. I don't know if it's going to work yet or, or not, but I'm happy to do that. So I'll, I'll go ahead and paste it in. There you go, if you want to copy paste. And then I will flash it and let's see what happens. And, and so now you're going to be forced to disconnect that cable from your robot. And since it's going to start running right away, I'm going to disconnect it. And then I'm going to reset the micro bit and see what happens. OK, I'm not turning enough. I think I need to turn about twice as much. So I'm going to change on my side that 600 to something like 1,200. And then I'm going to flash again. And this, this process of changing, flashing, is exactly what you'll do in class. And it's a great way to um, just evolve the robot to work really well. I almost got it about right. I think the magic number might be more like 1500 or so. Now, of course, if you reverse that wheel on the other side, you'll probably get there twice as fast. Except for that other robot in the way, I think I pretty much have a square now. Any other successes out there with this little project? I can't read your mouth, so use the thumbs up or, okay. <laughs> mm, pretty rewarding, right? It is fun. Okay, so I think at this stage, um, it might be good to look in the tutorials um, after class or look in the presentation for some examples. And um, what I didn't show you is how this could be abstracted quite a bit, quite nicely to become even simpler and simpler. So here's a version of the code we were just working with. Um, you can also create functions. And I'll go full screen so you could see this a little better. Come on, Google presentation. I didn't put that much in there. Loading, loading, ah, there we go. All right, so you can just create fun. These are definitions, and then you can just call them as functions, and they go at the top of your program, and you just identify them. So here, we're just going to straight, right? But if you notice, I didn't give any duration. I actually put it in the function. So that's really not very useful. So what might you do next? You might do something like this. Now, in this case, the speeds are, are fixed. They're hard coded into the function. And I'm just giving it a duration. So I'm just saying, 
which way to go and for how long. Pretty clear there? A few head nods. Yeah, okay. Yeah, do you like that? This is when Python gets a little more fun and I am far from a Python programmer because I'm sort of somewhere in between all these electronics and different processors all the time. I don't really know where my head is sometimes with coding, but um, I definitely go into the tutorials that we've made and then into the BBC docs to figure out more things. So here's your next level. This would be um, one function where I pass speeds and duration. So I give the left speed, right speed, and then for how long? And you can ignore the comments that they, they really shouldn't probably be there, but this is another way to make it even more useful. Pretty clear there? Head snotting a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so you see I just passed three values and they are dropped into these variables in the function. So the first one, 100, goes into the first spot, which is VL or velocity left. Then the second value I pass goes into VR. And then they're simply plugged into the function here. And there's another little fun thing. There's acceleration. So the robot, the way we've been programming it is would make a very rough ride for the passenger as we get slammed around from zero to 60 miles an hour. So you can also have some form of acceleration. And um, Marcus, your question, the debugger is largely the serial. So using the print command, and we haven't used it yet, but we will um, pretty soon here. Or you could use the LEDs on the back of the micro bit on the top. So acceleration, if you want to use this, there is a function called servo accelerate and you can give it values. And these, this might take a while to get your head around. Um, the acceleration value is the increment of microseconds change per servo pulse. So like values of two to six are really, are useful and you'll see it ramp up um, nice and steadily. So this looks far more organic. And there's even another level of abstraction you could do. And I'll show you just as an example, this is something I've just work, been working on for my own, my own uses. Let me open this up and I, I could send this out to you. This is to put the functions in their own module. Whoops. Cool. Bear with me for a moment. Three seconds and stops. Okay, so here's an example. Loading, hopefully, okay. Where I actually created a module called motion and I just use it. And it has in it a function called maneuver and I'm giving it left speed, right speed, um, acceleration and duration. And um, yeah, this is not in our tutorials, but I, I'll distribute it later today and you can try it and you can look at the motion module and see how it handles these things. All right, so I think what we should do now is, is move into, it's 2.49 and we'll probably go to like, well, it's 2.49 in the West Coast, dinner time where you are. Um, we'll probably go for like 20, 25 more minutes or as long as you wanna stay, just enough to get the whisker circuit built because it's a tough one. And then um, anyone that wants to stay afterwards is, is welcome to. So I wanna be aware of your, consider it towards your time and try to wrap in like 15 minutes. Um, if you went to the learn tutorials and I will give you the, the version from the um, slideshow instead, cause it'll be a little bit easier to follow. It's really the same content. And you clicked on Cyberbot and you scroll down to touch navigation for the cyberbot, you'll see in all of our tutorials the following. Usually there's a video um, in the beginning that shows you what the circuit does. And we were definitely using as many videos as we can to help students um, learn this way as well. So that's the whiskers you saw mounted on the front of the robot. 
Um, the next part of the tutorial is to build the circuits. And we try to provide the physical layout as, as well as a schematic and what we call a pictorial. So students using all the parallax tutorials, regardless of the platform, will come across the pictorial, which is what's shown here, as well as the schematic. And we provide both, and they pretty much will automatically go towards the schematic after a while, which is where we want them. And is, if you look at some of the more advanced tutorials, like the infrared um, object detection, you'll see it's a pretty complex schematic, and it actually helps to have this, this picture of how it works. So after we do this, the, the next most important step is to explain how things work. And the whisker circuit will give us a, a logic high or low when the whisker is activated. So we explain how it works. And then very important, this is a support item for you managing classes of students that have um, projects that don't work. It's about subsystem isolation, subsystem testing. So at some point, the student had something that worked and then they brought you a big pile of robot and wires and circuit and code that you really can't read during class that doesn't work. And what they need to be told and communicated about is how you make the little pieces work first and then you add to it. And then if it quits working, you back up. So with the whiskers as an example, you'll see that we first make the whiskers work and use the LEDs as feedback to show that they are working right before we make the robot go anywhere. So this script will simply test the whiskers and display their state on the microbits LEDs. All right, so we do this before we even roam. And then we can add in the roaming, the roaming code. So it's little, little, little steps. And um, it's a bunch of pieces to make anything like this work. So let's switch over and get out the parts. And let's see if we could build this and then um, get it debugged. In other words, just do the subsystem test to see that uh, it is working for us. These are the parts you'll need. I'll enlarge it for you. And then I will uh, grab a whisker ready robot so that we could look at as well. And maybe before Friday, we'll put this Google presentation on a diet. So go ahead and find these parts. You're looking for a couple of metal whisker wires and a total of four resistors. If you're over 40, you'll need your glasses. If you don't have a child nearby, A little puppy would find it, but she'd chew on it. You have a pug that eats resistors? Anything. She eats anything. Including stuff that's pretty disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. And after you got these parts handy, we can go over the physical build. And I, I just want to say this is tricky for students because they've never dealt with this kind of electromechanical dependency. So the, the, the physical circuit design has to be electrically correct. And then there's also the physical placement and the force at which you actuate the sensors needs some consideration. And then finally, your script has to work with it. And making all these things work is kind of a big experience. But this is the way we do things. Um, we don't black box anything. So are you all comfortable with me moving to the next slide? I can have uh, Josh or Matt, not yet, OK.
Josh, that's excellent advice about using the cell phone camera. I've done it many times. <laughs> but you aren't 40. <laughs> Not yet, getting closer. <laughs> it happens. 50% of the time, I guess. <laughs> And you can use the light too in the restaurant where you can't read the menu. Just use the light. And if the light doesn't work, use the light with the camera. <laughs> I had to educate my younger son, who's 19, that he too shall age. And that rock climbing without a helmet is not an option unless you want to expedite aging in irreversible directions. somewhere between the invincible and maturing stage, I guess. Y'all got those parts handy? Okay, then. One thumbs up, we'll move us on. All right, so here's a, a view of how they go on to the board. And you should have, if you follow the instructions, two longer, two standoffs on the front of the board and two little nylon washers and then some longer screws. Is everybody having fun? Is this like a craft class? Is anybody having a difficult time? Well, you're now in the only class I would have remembered in high school. Are those screws the same ones that we already have on that bot? Yeah, they are. Okay. They should be long, I think three quarter inches or so. Yeah, that looks good, Sarah. Good job. And while you're, you're putting this together, you'll notice there are two other servo headers on the, on the robot board that you can use to add all kinds of stuff. Ultrasonic sensors that rotate, um, a funny kitty cat face, any kind of crafty thing you might have in mind here. We've not even really touched on some of the possibilities. And Felicia pointed out, very important, don't forget one whisker above the washer, the other below. And this just, just allows them both to be actuated um, without conflicting with each other. But electrically, they, they, should, they can touch. It doesn't matter. They're both connected to ground. And if you get this uh, built, you can also go into the tutorial and copy and paste the code. You'll see that we give them the absolutely essential code, but we do not provide the try it code. We hold that out and then reserve the answers for the um, teacher only assessment material. If you're all willing, I'm going to advance the slide to a schematic and pictorial. And if I'm not disrupting you, I just want to remind you that Friday we'll have the award ceremony and there are three categories, the funniest coworker, the biggest fail, and the biggest win. And you can send me any of your videos, pictures, or whatever by Thursday night. Or Friday morning. Yeah. Sorry. 
so quick question. Um, I have my, is that the way it's supposed to look or is it supposed to be bent up a little bit more? Just uh, take those two whiskers, remove them and then flip them over so they look like the following. Do you see my, my um, camera view, John? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit of a puzzle. You have a 50-50 chance of putting them on the right way. Okay, I think I, I see what I did. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Please let me know if it's helpful for um, to see this circuit or I can go back to the prior slide. Okay. Uh, hey, Ken, on my particular one, I can get um, the, um, the LED for one of the whiskers. Once it, uh, you touch it, it stays on, but the other one does go off and on depending on uh, when you touch it and close it. Okay. Probably. Did you copy and paste our code? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Likely it's a, hmm, we'll see if others observe that, but maybe a wiring error. Maybe give it a close look to make sure that you're... They're not touching each other there. Yeah, you might have either a, the resistors um, going to the five volt might be touching the resistors going to the IO pins. So if you look really carefully at mine, you could see nothing is touching. And I realize for those who have not used a breadboard, we kind of we just oh I, know, yeah, I figured it out. I have I okay. got it going. I go I got it going to the wrong pin. <laughs> That's what it is. Where's the code to copy? Okay, in the tutorial, which I will jump over there and give you a link to it. And I will paste into the chat right now the page that has the sample code. And what I'd like to draw your attention to as you build this circuit is that you want these, um, these whiskers to be kind of easy to actuate so that when you press them, you see that they hit that little metal post. Is there a way you can zoom into the uh, resistors so sure. I can see those colors? Because it doesn't seem to match my color. How's that? Oh, that's better. Ooh, hey, there you go. OK, yeah, now I got it. I'm good to go, Ken. Sure, good. And uh, yeah, apologies to those who needed the breadboard education first. I realize we totally skipped that now. Um, so many teachers at this stage have seen breadboards, um, I should not assume. I'm sure there are some here that have not, but basically these rows are connected. So when you look on this area that I'm highlighting right now on the breadboard, and maybe I can draw around it. Why shouldn't you assume, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not very nice. I was excluding certainly some people by assuming that. But anyway, this, this, these five holes where you see this three pin header and the two resistors, these are all connected underneath within a little electrical strip. And you can always take a breadboard off of an old failed board and then rip it apart and see. And the reason why it's called a breadboard is because when radio came in, people would build their own radios on a board, which was usually the breadboard out of the kitchen. And so the, the three prongs, um, as Matt asked, 
they should be in the same row as the resistors because that is all connected electrically by a little copper strip underneath. Just to confirm those colors, um, are that two reds and a brown? That's right. Red, red, brown is 220. Right. And the other one, brown, black, orange, is 10K. Yeah. I'm not getting it to work. And so the 220 is a smaller resistor um, just to protect the IO pin. And the 10K is a what's called a pull-up resistor. So we have the equivalent of a light switch here that we'll be monitoring. Maybe uh, people could kind of let me know where we're at with the testing. Maybe a thumbs up if you've tested it successfully. Okay. How do you test it again? You test it by um, going to the code that's inside of the link that I'm pasting right now. It's in the tutorial. Click on that. In fact, I could go there and you can follow me first if you'd like. So I'll do that going to remove the image you're looking at for the moment. I'm clicking on the link and the tutorial opens up and I'm going to scroll down to the this code, whiskers detect test. I'm just going to copy it all. And then I'm going to jump over to the Python editor and I'm going to paste it in like I've done. And then I'm going to connect and flash, but I have to connect my robot first. Wireless programming was not automatically working. It doesn't exist, by the way. So I'll connect the robot now, and then I'll test it, and then I'll put the camera on it so you can see what's happening. Let me just got the water on. Oh, that's my fish tank. I'm sorry. Oh, I need water. Okay. <laughs> it's good. It's therapeutic, entertaining. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're looking at. Um, my robot on one side, and I'll make it a little bigger. And I have uh, flashed this script into it now. And I think I should turn off the lights to give you a better look. And when I press on the left whisker, I see that one of the LEDs goes on. And I let go, that LED goes off. And then I check on the right, and an LED on the right goes on. So we're, we're using the display set pixel, and we're just turning on one LED. But I think you could actually, at this point, go to the BBC Microbit docs and then figure out how to turn on the whole column of LEDs. Yeah, it's working just fine. I just had to wrap my head around the the antennae that are connected to the left is the right one and the right one that's connected so, yeah it's but i've got it it works fine yeah exactly right it's it's um 
reverse of what you would think. The left whis whisker physically touches the, the um, three thin header on the right side. And so how many possible states do we have here? Come on, somebody yelled out. Four. Yeah, exactly. And you have a new Python if else if statement here. Mm -hmm. And so you can save the script off and then you could come back here and light up the whole column of LEDs now. As I recall, it is the X, the Y, and then the brightness is the last value. So nine is bright and I think zero is off. So you can even make them dimmer. Oh. So you've just built a circuit. You've um, loaded the script in and you've tested it. You've seen a schematic, a pictorial. Now you're ready to make it roam. And I'm willing to bet that based on what you've seen earlier, you don't even need to look at the tutorial code, but you could just come in here and actually add in the drive routines. The drive functions, the bot 18. And what I'd like to point out too is in this program, once you're roaming, you're roaming in, in real time until you hit something. Then you have to actually back up for a fixed amount of time and turn to get away from it. So we'll look at the code in just a minute here. And we'll talk about homework. Any questions? No. So with this little breadboard, you can pretty much fit everything that's in the kit on it. You can make a, if you're running a class and, and you feel like you want some additional challenges, go ahead and turn off the lights in the class, open the blinds on one side of the room, lay out a bunch of boxes in the way, and have them make a light seeking robot that navigates from the dark side of the classroom out the door of the classroom. And you might need whiskers, you might need the light sensors, and you might need the infrared to adequately sense the whole environment. Predominantly navigating towards light while avoiding objects on the way. Do we have any successful whisker roamers yet? Okay, good. I see at least one. Dan has one in his picture. It's working. And remember, Dan, you can take the uh, cable off too and let it roam. And I think too, um, I'd like to ask if anybody is had any failures with the new cyberbot.py where on, only one motor was working. It seems that we may have fixed it with our class here. I'm going to move on and then um, obtain the roaming code and see that my robot works. And if you've completed the test, I'll just paste a link in that for the full roaming code so you can try that out.
How, how about if we end up doing something like this for blinkers? Somebody was talking about blinkers being on earlier. <laughs> Do you have a uh, camera showing? I can enlarge that. Okay. Just so oh, yeah. There you go. Video. Okay, hang on a second. Oh, okay. So what he's done is he found the image arrows. <laughs> You're ready for the left lane of I-80. Exactly. <laughs> and does the other one work too? No, I just, I only did the one for the right. I didn't get the one on the left yet. And did you do this by um, illuminating each pixel or did you find an arrow image to use? I, I just did each pixel. I just did a cut and paste and then added the numbers. But yeah, the, the displaying of the, the pixel would probably be the quicker one to do. Yeah, the image. That's yeah, nice though, that's really good. And so what I wanna point out about what you're showing too is you're using the LEDs as visual feedback really nicely. Always try to do this. You have a bunch of LEDs for free and they can show you where in your program your robot is while it runs. You got numbers, shapes, levels, anything you can fit on there. And there's also a speaker which we've not used. So the speaker could be used in that way too. And Further, the Microbit 2.0 has a microphone on it, which should serve some purpose for robotics. Very cool. Okay, we'll flash my robot and see that it works in case um, people have not seen this work yet. Then we'll grab a quick look at the schematic and discuss it for a minute. If you're looking at mine, you might notice as an example that it's not turning a whole lot and it's going to hit the, the wall or the cat or the dog twice before it really gets away. And I think you can fix that if you go to the code and you, you look at how the backup and turn function works, you could just make it much longer period of time. Whoa. So switching back to the script, let's look at it and see where I might change that. So yeah, it'd be quite a simple change. Um, just the, the left routine, my left function might be lengthened instead of a quarter second, turn for a second. So have fun with that. Back to the tutorial and then we'll work on wrapping it up because I know it's getting late. Here's what I was looking for. Ah, whoops, that didn't help me. Okay, so your, your microcontroller, whether it's a micro bit or an Arduino or whatever it is, um, is just monitoring the state of these whiskers as a high or a low. And in your case, um, 
The microbit can do this directly, but it's actually connected to a the propeller chip in between because the we've extended the capability of this micro bit to do things that it could not ordinarily do in robotics and to provide modules for things like ultrasonic sensors and to generate infrared <clears throat> high frequency LED light flashes that are in a future tutorial. We have this chip in there, it's a propeller chip, it's our own processor and it's checking the states of the whiskers. It's actually the device that you're talking to on the breadboard but it's very much transparent to the student. So um, when these whiskers are not pressed, you read a logic high on the IO pin, and that's 3.3 volts. And that's just because the, the power is connected through a resistor directly to the IO pin, and it's not grounded um, through the chassis. But when you press that whisker, it's much less resistance to ground to the chassis, and then the I.O. pin reads zero. So you could think of this microcontroller sitting there as a, a monitor of the, the state of this circuit, detecting a higher low. If you keep going with this circuit, since you've got it built up, try the escaping corners um, and try to uh, keep track, you can make a little counter, a variable that keeps track of how many times you turn left, for example, so you know you don't just keep doing that because I think your default code that you're running right now will put you in a corner and allow you to bounce back and forth and not escape that corner because you're turning left and right. So that's intentional. You could try that and then you could add a speaker um, for backup buzzer if you want, which is fun. Or you could get very obnoxious like I've done on my um, red and white, red and blue flashing robot. So if we don't have questions, we'll talk about the, the homework for Friday. Is anybody hungry for dinner yet? Ah, always? <laughs> okay, so for Friday, how about if you advance on and bring a working circuit to the um, back to the class. Choose the visible light or the infrared. So uh, this is more of an analog circuit. So you've been so far you were digital, high or low. Here's an analog circuit, and you can measure light, follow light, or avoid it. So build that one, or build the infrared. And this one is far more difficult to get right, but you can do it now. So try either of those circuits, build them up, program them. Um, see if you can get them to work also with whiskers. And you might have to move some parts around on the breadboard. And then you really write your own. You'll have to combine scripts to achieve that. So just want you to get a little more experience with some of the, the use of the tutorials and do what a student might do in class. And we will go over how those work on Friday. And then we'll also talk about cybersecurity, which we've not even mentioned, but this is a tremendous strength of our tutorials. There are approximately 200 pages of content that we've not even looked at um, that use the radios in the micro bit. And I'll show you how to wirelessly control the micro bit on Friday. So, It'll be a little bit of a show and tell discussion. Here's a two-way texting example. So you can actually set this up in class when we're back in class where all of your students have a micro bit connected and they can do live chat over the terminal with each other. And this is really fun when you start it, but it gets really dangerous really quickly when they figure out that they are uncensored. Usually it's about 30 seconds of fun and then you are moving them on to the next thing. So usually we'll, I'm the one that gets in trouble first. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they want to have fun. It's good to, to be a little bit edgy, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll show you some of the stuff that you can do with the, uh, the radios. Here's a really good example. Just take a quick look at this before we leave for the day. You can control every single robot in your class from your computer using the radio that's on the micro bit. And this video, shall it ever load, 
would be that example. Mm, this was my day all day. <laughs> Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> and that one robot that was moving fast had the jumper on the end. So was, the batteries were providing a higher voltage to the servo motors. There's one in every crowd, I'm told. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, so we'll conclude today. And I'm going to stay here for support issues. And I will send the homework as a reminder by email. Um, later this evening, along with the video. And um, if anyone has any hardware questions or anything related to any of this, I'll hang around and answer them.